Africa Network. He joins us live in studio. Good evening, Isaac, and thank you so much for joining us. Now, first things first, is this an ideal time to proceed with the trial um, of the alleged coup plotters? I think it's an ideal time. I mean, the, the insurgency actually came there just to come and try to forestall the, 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 the trial. But why would they do that? Why, why would they want to delay the trial? Well, they don't want to delay the trial. I mean, the insurgents want to delay the trial simply because it's a, it's a general scheme of things. You know, there's much more involved than what you see on the face. Can you just, what, what's the latest violence in terms of what is it indicative of? We were having a chat here before going on air, and uh, you mentioned a few things. Can you just explain to us and break it down for us and for the viewer with regards to Rwanda's involvement in, in um, the violence that's erupted in, in Burundi? Yeah, you see, what's happening, in fact, it's a thing which is uh, empirical. It's been taking place for a long time. If people observe in the Great Lakes area over the period of about 10 years, we realize that rebellions in countries which Rwanda does not agree with, countries like the DRC, those rebellions, they've actually been fostered by the Rwandese. Yeah, they've been behind the things. It's a thing which is actually well proven. In this case, you find that uh, with the third term, the political um, trigger, may you see, you find that uh, the milit part of the military, uh, Burundi military, actually sort of uh, left the military, they went a wall, and they went to Rwanda. And there were, at, there were claims that Rwanda was actually training a rebel forces. But now what we are seeing is just that, what has been happening. In fact, right now we find that there are statements which are coming from NGO, uh, NGOs within, Burundi, within Rwanda, which is actually sort of asserting the fact that there are refugees who are being forcibly trained by people who are connected to the Rwandan government. They've not actually said that the Rwandan government is behind it, but there is an involvement of the Rwandan army and Rwandans in the present insurgency in Burundi. Now, let's speak to the issue of uh, President Pierre Nkurunziza um, basically going in for a third term and elections taking place during violent clashes um, with regards to the Burund Burundian people not wanting him to take a third term. What's mm. the situation there? And can you just give us a bit of some background? Well, the third term is a controversial thing. When you say the Burundian people do not want him for a third term, you find that there's a very big uh, constituency which wants him. Yeah, basically he's uh, very popular among the rural Hutu people. But then you find that, again, with the third term, it went to a constitutional court, where the constitutional court said that he, was, um, he could stand for a third term. There were legal arguments which were put forward. Uh, some people don't agree. The president of the legal, of, of the constitutional court said that they were coerced, and he left, and he went to Rwanda. But I mean, this is a political item. And the third term is not a new, is not a new controversy that has come up in that area. Uganda have had a third term, there was a lot of controversy, but that was team ruled. But there's nobody in the region who actually went and tried to exploit that uh, anomaly to actually foster rebellion within Uganda. The same thing is taking place in Rwanda right now, whereby uh, the, um, Kagame is going for a third term, and it is a well-handled, stage-managed uh, process where you find even the peasants who were signed the petitions, they will sign the petition forcibly. The army was there, and those are, those are the right reports from people who are on the ground. The army was there, and the peasants were told that they either sign it or they lose uh, advantages in the development, so they were forced to sign. But nobody has come up to actually question the Rwandan third term or to come and foster rebellion. But in cases of Burundi, you find that uh, the big people in the region who are actually driving for a regional hegemony. And that's the thing that we've actually got to notice in the, we've got to realize in the politics of the Great Lakes. Yeah, uh, Rwanda and Uganda, they're really actually there to fight for a hegemony of the region, be it in the DRC or in, um, in, 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 in Burundi. Now, they are the ones who are actually encouraging and fostering uh, resentment, rebellion, and now insurgency. I think this is the thing that the international community has got to come up to tell Burundi, Rwanda and Uganda to, to a less extent to actually sort of step out and not fan the flames. Now, speaking of the international community, um, uh, they have come out to say that uh, they would not like to see um, the 
violence in Burundi um, sort of degenerating to becoming ethnic violence. What's the thinking behind that? Is this ethnically uh, uh, generated or, as you say, it's, yeah. it's, it's more of a control of you the region? Okay. You find that in the region, Rwanda and Burundi, these two countries have had a genocidal uh, uh, coexistence, I mean the, the tribes coexistence. Yeah, people are uh, tend to blame the Hutus, but that it's traditional. It has been, the, it's vice versa. Yeah, there's nobody who's much more guilty, who's more guilty than the other. Burundi has had very serious cases of uh, pogroms, ethnic cleansing, and also ethnic violence. And uh, with the Arusha Accord, they tried to solve that aspect of uh, ethnicity by coming up with the constitution, having the Russia talks, which again were highly faulted. Although us as South Africans, we tend to pride ourselves because our late President Mandela was involved, but those talks were very bad in the sense that they were not all inclusive. The rebels who were then the, in the forest were not invited, but then J the President Jacob Zuma came and invited them back in the fold, and then they had the, the rebels uh, agreed to the Arusha talks. But the Arusha talks themselves, there was something which is very bad about them. It was more of caveats against uh, who to take over. You find that in the Arusha Accord, which has been taken to the Constitution, um, the opposition, they need a four, uh, four fifths, that's 80% vote in Parliament to change the Constitution. You've never heard of that anywhere in the world, where you've got to have an 80% vote. And again, you find that uh, there's a 60-40 Hutu to Tutsi makeup of parliament and other governmental bodies. But you find that the Tutsis are just 20 percent. So you find that there is always a caveat. And this is a serious thing which is going to create problems. Just in closing, you sh people should remember the, the Lebanese constitution, which was actually put in place by the French when they hived off Lebanon from Syria where they wanted to form a state which was dominated by the Christians, Mennonites. They put in things which are actually ethnically based, where the Christians are going to have dominate the army, dominate the presidency, dominate parliament. And a time when the Muslims came to a majority, um, they demanded more power, and the thing blew up. It's just what's happening now. I think the Hutus, they want more power in a situation where power is being given too much to the other side. And that is the result of a very bad agreement at Arusha. Are we likely to see a civil war? Well, that's the thing that people are scared of. I mean, to say that it's not even a civil war, it's an ethnic war. But up to now, they're saying that the problems there, they're mostly not non-ethnic. But according to the way that things have been driven from Rwanda, it's actually going towards an ethnic, it's going to have an ethnic dimension. African leadership, the AU, always says, and, and African leaders in general, always speak of Africans solving their own problems. Are African leaders doing enough to solve the problems that are taking place in Burundi and that region? I've got very strong views about what the, the EU's role in solving African problems. I will not even go to Burundi. I will just sort of go to places like Mali, the CAR, and also the South Sudan, where the African Union, they lost the initiative. Uh, the solution of, the, of uh, the South Sudan, and that was also taken up by the Triarca, uh, spearheaded by the Americans. Yeah, John Kerry was there forcing everybody to sign. And people were signing things, they were signing things which were never talked, were never on the agenda. Yeah, but they were given us a deadline to sign. The same thing with the CAR. The CAR solution basically, it's more or less a French solution. And the two contending uh, situations, the CAR, it was the French who wanted immediate uh, elections, and who came in was the UN, Ban Ki-moon. Ban Ki-moon said, let us first strengthen the institutions of states, yeah, before we can hold elections. But it appears that now people are going for elections. And over half of the country is still in the Seleka rebels. Now the French, it appears they want to put in a person who is pro-French in a week, you know, election which could not be national, and then they move forward from that. But the, where was the AU with its solution? So basically, I think also in uh, Burundi, although they've appointed a regional uh, mediator in the form of Mzeveni, there are not clear uh, sort of indications as what needs to be happened, what needs to happen. We find that with the election, the statement that came from the AU, they call for a postponement of the election until uh, the situation returned to normality. Uh, and the government never did so. They say that the imperatives of the constitution, which were forcing them to hold the elections then, that was in May, I think.
in April. Now, if like in your view, what what should ideally happen in Burundi? Well, ideally, with a certain thing, I mean, ideally, you find that uh, there are figures within the opposition, so within government, who are really uh, headstrong. If people are really serious about uh, having a political situ uh, solution, and uh, on the third term, the opposition could have come together and organized itself and actually vote the man out. There was a very big case of the third term in, in, in Nigeria. Yeah, I mean to say that um, good luck was not, um, people said he was not supposed to get there. They went to court and he won his day. They said they could stand for, this, for the third term. Yeah, or it was for a second term. The first term it was not his, as in the case of uh, President Tabumbeki. He finished Mandela's uh, term. Yeah, but then people went, he went to elections and people voted him out. The same thing also happened in Senegal with Wadi. He went to court and the court said they could stand for a third term. Yeah, but the people organized themselves and they voted him out. Now, if the Burundian opposition politicians were serious and they had the people behind them, they could have voted him out. Now, let's go back to, to very briefly. There are reports of people who may have been targeted in Burundi by the military and executed for reasons unknown. Your well, take on that? Yes, in fact, that's the other sad part of it. I will not even say by the military, it's vice versa. You know, I mean to say that uh, the opposition also has been targeting key um, people within the military whom they saw they were pro-government and also key people within the ruling party, CNDD, FDD, yeah, who have been assassinated, and vice versa. There are key people within the NGOs, within the civil societies, yeah, who are very vocal. They have also been eliminated. So we've got to be very careful when you say that the government is doing this, the government is doing that. Yeah, the government basically, it is politicians on two sides who are hard-headed and they're actually eliminating each other. And that thing has got to come under control. Now, uh, it's like I know with, with regards to, you're very passionate with regards to African issues and everything that it stands for. Um, is the international community, apart from the African Union, are they doing enough to assist with the situation in, uh, in Bujumbura? Well, that's the thing. The uh, international community has, has left it to the EU, but you find that the EU has actually sort of in, uh, entrusted their talks in Brussels, the former colonial master in trying to solve the solution, um, to, to solve the problem. And I do not know what solution it, come, it will come to because the opposition is adamant in saying that Nkuruzinza has got to go. But basically, there are very serious shortcomings within the constitution and within the running of, um, well, within the, of, within the formation yeah, of the Burundian state, which actually needs to be looked into and actually solved. You find that with the other parties, the international community, the Americans, they tend to call for human rights. Uh, they tend to, right now, they are actually sort of, unfortunately, they are actually finding the flames in the sense that they are actually taking in um, freelance journalists and actually training them in social media. It is taking place in Burundi, it's taking place in, in, in the DRC. They've been taken to the states. Now that is actually to help the opposition. So you find that um, these interventions by this, uh, the international state, they've got to be neutral. And they've really got to struggle to bring in peace and not to come and actually push a certain sector of the whole debacle. Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, that was Isaac Komu, a resident political commentator with the SABC's Channel Africa Radio.